All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to class two of painting clouds, trees and water offered through Oregon Society of Artists. I am excited to see what you guys have done this week. I think you guys, uh, I've never had such a busy class. I don't think I've ever had so much homework, if you want to call it homework, home play, whatever, um, turned in. Look at that. Nice. Um, so there's so much stuff on the Facebook page. I will not have time to go through and critique and give feedback to everybody. Otherwise, that would take our entire three hours. Um, but I do like to go through and grab a couple and discuss uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and kind of give feedback. And that way, we're all learning from each other, right? And I just, quick note, we learn so much from our less than fully successful paintings. So please remember that. This is you know, not a graded class. You're all already my best friends. You don't need to earn my friendship. Love you all. Um, and so just keep playing, keep experimenting, keep pushing yourself a little bit, uh, just a touch out of your comfort zone and try new things. That's what these classes are about. I'm not expecting excellence. I'm not even expecting fully finished paintings if you don't want to. So just uh, doing it, sharing it, uh, Feel free to discuss with each other and give feedback to each other on the Facebook page as well. The more involved we all are, the uh, better for sure. And again, we are learning from each other as well as me, um, hopefully. So I also have two big points that I wanna go over in the painting of clouds. So this is week two of painting clouds. Next week, we will be painting trees. Um, so today I would like to talk about gesture, which is something we're going to go over again in uh, trees as well. Um, it's gesture and edge quality. And edge quality is going to come back up both in trees, rocks, and water a, a lot. Edge quality is very important when we, and what I mean by that is hard edges versus soft edges, lost edges versus found edges. Um, that is gonna come up a lot in everything we're gonna be painting in this class. So the gesture, meaning the movement or the flow is very much just like if you've ever done figure painting or yeah, figure painting portraiture some, to some degree. Um, it's kind of the danciness, it's the movement of the object. And clouds are so spectacular in that, right? Clouds can almost, become anything they you know we love laying in the grass and looking up and you know finding the rabbits and the wolves and the clouds so clouds can really do and become almost anything and we want to look for the movement the flow and the great thing about clouds is they're changing every couple minutes right especially on a windy day so if a cloud if your reference, the cloud is not doing exactly what you want like maybe it's pointing the wrong direction or whatever it is, feel free, always, always, write that in all capital letters, always feel free to manipulate your clouds. Change them to do what you want, okay? They are one of the greatest secret weapons we have in designing landscape paintings. Because for the most part, people don't question clouds. Everybody's seen clouds do everything you know if your tree is too crazy or your mountains are weird or your creek is defying gravity uh your trails too steep or too whatever um people will you know call foul say you know that doesn't look right but clouds we get a lot more leeway does that make sense everybody great um so what I, you saw my collection that I just turned in, the 250 photos of clouds that I turned in. I, I have a whole huge um, folder on my computer just filled with cloud references. So when I'm painting, oftentimes I'll combine a creek or a field or a farm or a mountain, a group of trees from another photo and clouds from yet a third photo. And then I will even look to my reference folder filled with just color references. You know, it could be carpets, it could be uh, uh, clothing advertisements, any kind of color combinations that I'm excited by. And so now I've just got four 
four different references laid out. I may even, if I'm getting crazy, lay out a piece of literature, be it a little short paragraph or a poem, something that's kind of capturing the mood and the idea of the piece I wanted. It could be a piece of classical music or whatever it is. And between all those things, I'm taking pieces from all of it. It's wonderful, but rare when we get one reference that gives us everything, right? The perfect photo, right? And sometimes you just take it and you know, this is perfect. The waves are all beautiful. The clouds are perfect. The lighting is just great. The lighthouse off in the distance. You know, the figures are posed just so hanging out romantically on the beach, but rarely does that happen. Usually a good painting for me means manipulating, editing, and a lot of forethought to what needs to be added or take more importantly, taken away from the reference. Make sense, you guys? I think too often we become slavish or very much stuck to the reference. So I showed you those examples where I was literally taking photos out of my moving car, right? And I've seen students paint in corners of the road, some fence kind of flying by or a branch way down in the foreground that's not necessary, it's just blocking the scene. You know, if they could have just ducked down and moved beyond that branch, that low hanging branch, they would have got a better photo. The other thing is just pretend it's not there. Um, if my mountains, like when I paint the gorge, the Columbia River Gorge, if I'm painting from up high, those big, great cliffs appear more subtle from up high than they do when we're down driving along the water's edge. Those cliffs just feel so grand and big. And I know that when I'm painting the gorge, I want that feeling of grandness. So oftentimes I will literally just make them bigger <laughs> than they actually appear because I want them to feel like they feel to me, right? The same thing can be done with the clouds. You know, these clouds are moving, they're flowing, it's maybe a windy day or a storm is coming or going or whatever, and I want to make the painting feel that. I want to feel the movement in my painting, and I can't really do it with the landscape as much except for maybe make the trees a little like the wind is blowing them in a certain direction, but in the clouds, I certainly can create the idea of movement. All right, and that's done both through the gesture and the edge quality. So that's what we'll be talking about today. My goal is to do a couple uh, small demos for you. Um, so we have quite a bit to go through really quickly. Um, I'm gonna go over to our Facebook page. I'm gonna very quickly look through a couple of our uh, paintings that were turned in. Please don't take it personally if I pick or don't pick your pictures at all, okay? We just don't have time to go through everybody's. And I'll try to pick different students each week. If you would really like um, feedback on it, um, you know, maybe let me know ahead of time and I can do it or I can always write it between weeks um, if I get the chance to get to the Facebook page. And again, give each other feedback um, as well. So let's pop over there uh, to the Facebook page. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pull up a couple of the reference photos that I turned in and show you examples of gesture and edge, uh, different types of edges in the references. We will then take a break. I'll stop the video. And we will step up to the easel and I will do uh, one or two quick black and whites with acrylic. Then I will transfer over to oils and do an oil uh, landscape painting of a beach scene again, showing uh, different types of clouds. And then if time lets us, my goal is to go back to the acrylic painting and glaze in to those. So that I'll show a little bit about glazing on top of acrylic paints using uh, cloud and design. So that's my goal. We'll see if we have enough time. I always way overstuff these classes. Um, if you've been with me, you know that there's always ends up being something that gets left on the cutting room floor, but that's just because I'm so ambitious and I uh, have so much to share. But uh, what, what can we do in three hours? Let's see. So share screen and I'll take you over to Facebook.
Everybody see his Facebook page? Perfect. Yes. Perfect, perfect. All right. So um, let's see who is live with us today. I don't think Karen is here. Um, so I can go simply over to, I can scroll down. And I'm glad, Kathleen, you were able to join us and saw the message. Yeah, I don't know why it's saying 930 on some of them, but it truly is nine. Did I leave that up here? Um, anyways, nine o'clock every class. So I apologize. There was some miscommunication on that. Um, aha, so Karen says, I've taken a couple classes from Michael Orwick over the past year. I love creating, but I have a nasty habit of getting mad at myself when I fail often and fail. Oh, when I fail often and fail hard a favorite mantra of these classes. So here's me and my beautiful failures this week. Where the, where's the light source again? Wonderful proof that I need another cloud painting lesson this week. All right, well, there's Karen. Um, and so, yeah, one of my mantras, and I, I, I should uh, change it a little bit because I think it's a little bit uh, rough and abrupt for some people, but I do, I even, to myself, say fail often fail hard and learn basically that's the key is and learn um when i'm looking at my paintings i try to be both generous and tough on myself so i'll often look at my paintings and say this worked this was great but also this part needs work this part could be better right um and i do believe that it is way better to paint a lot of paintings than it is to really, really work on a couple paintings. I think that painting and moving on, painting and moving on, we will be, you know, at the end of this class, spending two weeks on a final project. So that's where we'll slow it down and really try to refine some things and make things work. But for the next couple of weeks, while we're just practicing and learning new information, who could expect us to have masterpieces, right? In fact, when we're learning, it's almost impossible to have masterpieces because everything's going crazy in our brain. There's so much new information, so many new ideas. Um, and that being said, not a failure, Karen. This is quite beautiful. Um, she's got the overlapping that we talked about in the cloud. She's got the dark underbelly of the clouds, the mid values, the top light. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of successful things we're going to be going through today and working on giving a little more gesture and a little more movement and some edge quality. But for week one, this was pretty much exactly what I was hoping for. So great job. Um, okay, so beach scene looks like possibly Hawaii. I see a couple pine palm trees back there. So her reference nice clouds. So this is a great one for even this week. So you got these clouds up here where the very soft dissipated edges. And then some of these clouds are a little more distinct, right? The edges are a little firmer, not as sharp as this dark landscape form against the sky, but quite a bit sharper than up here. Does that make sense? Soft versus harder edge versus medium edge. And then also look at this nice dancey movement in these clouds and you see this line of this kind of cloud coming up almost wave like up here in the background clouds you get this nice movement and like this we're going to go over and i'll show you some ways that I work on gesture. And here we go so Karen nice job good colors good uh, lights and darks but yeah you've kind of. Uh, veered away from some of the nice movement, some of the things that I thought were more exciting in those clouds. So that'll be something you get to work on. Maybe this will be another good reference for this week. I know Karen's not with us right now, but hopefully she'll be able to uh, watch this in the recording. I'm going to go to the recent media. Oh, how do I see all of the recent media? There it is. Filter? Yeah, I just had to get down to the see all. So yeah, look at all this work you guys turned in. That is so great. I'm going to go in reverse order a little bit because some of you were so quick and turned in stuff. Linda turned in your painting literally the day after the last class, I think. 
Um, great job, Linda, getting just nice, strong shapes. It's almost like posterized clouds to a way, right? It's got, everything's kind of nice and cut out. There's a little bit of soft softening of edges throughout, but that's not what this assignment was out about. This assignment was literally about building the form, having a light side, a mid value side and a dark side um, and giving the idea of form. It really looks like beautiful popcorn, right? Um, shapes, like there's a definite shape, a structure to these clouds. And that's a lot of times how I will start my clouds. It's exactly like this. Nice job, Linda. And then I will go through and find some edges that I want to really soften and some edges that I want to leave harder where I want to keep attention. Remember, the uh, viewer's focus is drawn towards sharp edges. So, uh, and stronger contrast and softer edges allow our eyes just to skim across and basically kind of tell us nothing here to look at, right? It's not important. Also, hard edges will feel a little more stuck, a little more um, in place, whereas soft edges will feel like a sense of movement. Great. So this is really nice. Great job building the structure and everything else. Um, okay, maybe I'm going the wrong direction here. Great, so here's her photo reference, I believe. Yep, nice job, Linda. Um, Linda, are you with us? There you are, Linda. Yes, I am, thank you. Great, thank you, nice job, beautiful. And yeah, these are such, this is great cloud references for this, for this assignment. Um, you could even go in here and just, you know, edit out different areas and have uh, just, there's lots of great shapes and lots of great forms and the varying soft and uh, you know hard and found edges, which we'll be working with this week. And again, this nice gesture, look at these movements that you can play up if you want um, going forward. Um, yeah, do you wanna add anything about what you learned or what you thought of this assignment? I really enjoyed doing it. I tried to paint without blending a lot because I tend to blend too much. Great. Oh, yeah. I was really trying hard to leave some of the brush strokes. Um, yeah. So that's great. So Linda just did a perfect example of kind of how I do when I critique myself. And also before I start painting, I'm often giving myself little challenges. So Linda right there said, you know, I, I'm over blending. Oh, uh, maybe I will under blend a little bit or lean towards that side of it and push myself in that direction as well. So Within each assignment, there's always things that we can do to push ourselves. Um, you know, we all have like Michelle's been working on, you know, just holding the brush differently. Um, Kathleen's been working on, um, you know, really identifying the light source and using overlapping and uh, value differences to create the sense of depth. We all have different things. We're all at different levels and we're all pursuing different things within our paintings. And I hope I will learn like what is Fred working on and you know what is Barbara working on so that I can help you guys as we move forward. But nice job, Linda. I really appreciate it. And yeah, you were so fast. I got that done so quickly. Oops, let's keep going the wrong direction here. Susan, beautiful. Look at these colors. All right. Um, so uh, did you do one or two, Susan? Oh, two. I did two. Okay. Okay, I turned my sound on. First of all, I want to say you opened up my mind so much. When I did a painting, I never thought I'll get, you know, of anything with the sky as being a landscape within itself. Mm. And not made me think that the sky is a picture, a landscape within itself. This one here, the day after class in Bymart parking lot in Beaverton. <laughs> uh, I know where that is. <laughs> it's right down the road from my house. Yeah, me too. So I don't know if you can see this, but here's the picture on the computer. I looked up and, and my goal here was to do overlapping soft edges and something you said, I mixed the grays with color, not black. I didn't use any black. Wow, that's great. Yeah. I would never have guessed that. that. I mean, you see some warms in here, but yeah, these look like you definitely used, look at those gorgeous grays. Wow, nice job. I, I didn't use any black. And then the other one is a picture. I've got the, I don't know if you can see. I love those clouds, by the way. 
Well, thank you. Th this picture here, I've got it in my hand. I don't know how to show it to Michael. It was taken. Just hold it up in front of your face. Six years ago in Zihuatanejo, Mexico. And I, the, the homework was, uh, one of them was, this is what I did on this one, is color. So I focused on the reflection of the sky in Zihuatanejo. I mean, the skies there were like something to drool over. Can you guys see Susan at all, or is it just showing me? Well, I got the picket. Well, the picture's on the. I can see it. But it's not as beautiful as the photograph I have. And the thing is, is that I worked with the, the part of color and reflection into the water. And I think on the left, I should have made, now that I, the picture's dried, I think I should have made it darker. But I wanted to ask you a specific question. Would this be a good opportunity, like in the other class I took from you, to glaze the left side with a darker color to make it dark? Yes, 100%. Yeah, that's a, op, a perfect opportunity for glazing. You know, your paint, if it's in oils, it has to be completely dry. Oh, okay. You okay. cannot glaze into a wet painting. And for those of you who are new to glazing or the idea of glazing within oil paints or acrylics, I will talk about that when we get up to the easel. But what I think of it as is just putting like a transparent, almost like a piece of glass with a color over it. So like in these clouds. Um, okay. Susan could easily, if she thought, oh, you know what, I need to warm these up a little more. Yes, you yes. could glaze with a transparent color over the warms. You could darken by doing a transparent, darker color, whatever it is. It could be even black if you have a really? transparent, if you have a transparent black. No. Um, very quickly, Susan, um, just to, on a quick critique that is not about the clouds on your painting, sure. horizon line is of the utmost importance. Your horizon line is um, angled, and uh, so when you show water or ocean, unless you're going to go very angled, like you're doing it very stylistically, it's worth taking a ruler or whatever else and being pretty distinct. Oh, okay, great. Now yours is literally like the water is kind of oh, it's slowly running down yeah, yeah. this way. So straight lines across, and if this is a mountain back here, I'm not sure, maybe yeah. it is. And you, yeah, you just yeah, want the picture. <laughs> it's on my nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. I, well, I can see it. I don't know if everybody else can. But, but yeah, the bottom you know, line is, you worked with me on that when you were in in class about a year ago, making it the horizon line darker at OSA. And so yeah. I you do need to remember that. Thank you so much. Well, darker sometimes it can get lighter. Um, sorry. Um, but uh, just watching your horizon lines, keeping it flat. Right now, it's kind of wishy-washy. And again, yeah. it feels kind of like everything's running from the right down to the left, like there's a slant in your water. Thank you so much. I no see problem. I see nice it. Nice job in your colors. Beautifully done. Um, yeah, if after this dries, you can ex definitely experiment with um, uh, glazing. And you know what? Um, I know Susan well enough to know that this probably was difficult for you. This is so loose and gestural <laughs> and that you just, uh, Susan really likes to work slowly with little paint brushes. Yeah. And uh, I would say yeah. <laughs> this is a big aha. And this is a perfect opportunity, again, to work on multiple things within one assignment. You're working on color, you're working on clouds, but also you're challenging yourself to get comfortable with making and leaving a couple brush strokes. I mean, look at how gestural and energetic that feels, right? I mean, it has a very impressionistic, it has a very of the moment. Um, if you told me this was a plain air painting, I would believe you because it looks like it was done quickly, just trying to capture the energy and the, the you know, getting an impression of while you were there, right? So I like that and I'm not, I'm nothing against tight and rendery paintings, I like all of it. I love impressionism, I love, you know, abstract even sometimes. Um, I like all of the different ways of painting. I just think that it's great for us to have all of those abilities, because sometimes a more impressionistic and much, much more brushy and loose feeling works better because of what we're after. I'm after the movement, I'm after the energy of this piece. Sometimes a very tight, and rendery and photographic rendering is the right thing to do, right? Um, I get myself in trouble as a painter, as an artist that makes his living by selling in galleries, because I do let the paintings dictate 
uh, the style in which I paint a little too often, meaning that sometimes my when I go to a show to turn in my work to a gallery to turn in my work for a show, um, I have a collection of work that doesn't really go together as well as maybe other artists would. Um, but I can't help it. I just love painting all different ways. I love, you know, all these different effects. And I just want to keep playing. Maybe at some point I'll knock down my, you know, very distinctive style. But at this point, I'm still playing. I'm still learning. I'm still experimenting. And I urge you, at least during class, to do the same. So great job. I'm very proud of you, Susan. I know that that was difficult. Go ahead. No, thank you so much. I just uh, didn't get the intensity with my palette as I, it, the picture on my nose, as the real picture is that I took a photograph of. Great. Well, you can. That's why I was late. In fact, I will show you a painting that I just did the same thing with literally yesterday. Oh, I took, oh, painting, wow. I took to the gallery, uh, my new gallery down in Salem, Oregon. I took down there and it, they, um, they were going to take three paintings out of 10. They ended up taking eight. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, but, you know, the, you're kind of like, well, why did these two not make the cut? And um, one of them I thought was the for sure one they would take, even in the top three. Uh, but the one that the other one they didn't take was just boring. It really was. It had an interesting idea and um, it was fun to get it back into the studio yesterday and liven it up and uh, by glazing. So I will show you that and we can talk about that, but very nicely done. Thank you so much, Mike. Yep, yep. Um, Mike. Let's see. Oh, you're fine, Mike or Michael, I don't mind. Susan, Susie, I don't mind either. Oh, wow, all right. Um, what else do we got here? I wanna grab one more. Look at that one there. This one here? Up, up one. Now that, oh, yeah, aren't those beautiful? Yeah, beautiful, but this isn't clouds so much, it's just sky colors, which is very important. Great job, Jill, if you're here. Um, these transitions are beyond gorgeous. I mean, oh, I literally looks delicious. <laughs> like a beautiful, beautiful flower. You're making me hungry. Oh, yeah, Thank yeah. you. Like Thank you. Beautiful dessert I'm or a beautiful uh, orchid or something, right? Just these rich colors. Very lovely, Jill. Nice job. I don't, I just, I want to deal with clouds now. Um, let's go to these two. I think this is the reference. So Jill, oh, good, I get to talk about Jill anyways. Um, what a reference. Crazy, beautiful yeah. clouds. I mean, that would make me stop my car and pull over or at least be dangerous and take some photos out the side window. Um, <laughs> but yeah, even like last weekend when I was just taking pictures of clouds, I would literally just have to keep pulling over and letting cars pass me because I was out on country roads and I didn't want to, you know, but, and I just wanted to make sure I could drive as slow as I wanted on these country roads and take the photos and everything else. So anyways, I, Jill, I hope this is one of your photos. Jill. No, it is not. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Use what you need. This is, yeah, just nice job. Um, and let's go to your photo of it, painting of it. Oh, wow, look at the change. So I, this is from that, that reference, right, Jill? Yeah. Loosely. I love that you changed it so much. So, so often for me, the reference photos that I choose are literally just a jumping off point. Like I said, I'll combine them. A lot of times I just kind of, oh, this is exciting. I want to capture, you know, the warmth and that transition and the big bulbous uh, shape of it just looks so wonderful. So, gosh, I keep going the wrong way. Sorry, guys. Um, but look, she changed the, the ground form completely. So it looks like we're out in nature, maybe the kind of the top ridge of a hill got a little hill kind of hinted at back here the density underneath the cool density where the light's not coming uh, single light source very nice job jill keeping your light consistent throughout the piece and i like that you simplified the cloud that cloud was really crazy you know if you wanted yeah. to it would be wonderful to kind of come in and challenge yourself to capture all those ridges and you know uh, wrinkles and everything else but this is well, just, I, and it's still, I started off trying to do that and it, it just wasn't working for me. <laughs> okay, well, good. I mean, that's fine. I love it as it is. You know, if I didn't see that reference, I would think this is so nice and complete. Your colors, you've really got a sense of color already. Thank you. 
Is that from taking my color class? Just kidding. It, it is. <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> All right, well, A plus for you. You nailed it. I mean, both of these paintings have such nice colors. Um, these transitions from the purples into the kind of peachy uh, salmon-y colors, that is a difficult transition, right? Because it wants to get muddy. Because right yeah. within this area, you've got blue, red, and yellow, which makes brown. So really nice job controlling that transition and getting up. I mean, not easy. You can see some areas where it begins to get a little muddier. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really bother me because that's, you know, you kept the edges soft. You're not drawing our attention over here. And that will happen as all those colors get combined. My one thing that I would, you know, if I were looking at this, if I was judging this, um, is that it's a little bit boring. It's kind of yeah. a big haystack shape is kind of a lump of a cloud. So maybe mm -hmm. I would take some of this blue and carve it in just so it gets a little bit of a shape or a movement. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to overdo it, but you know, that's my only thing, really. This is quite nice. Thank you. Yeah, great job. Let's see if we do one more. I think here's a good one. Oh, I already talked about Linda. Nice job, Linda, and your color uh, gradations. Um, I think that this purple may be a little bit um, overbearing, that it's fighting this purple so beautiful that it's wanting to fight with the beautiful colors up here. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree. I, I, purple, but I would I probably need, gray down areas of that. Go ahead, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I think, I think the purple definitely needs to be grayed way down. And I, I also think the sky may be a little too bold. Um, I didn't know if there was a way to sort of lighten the whole thing so it's not quite so strong. Yeah, you can definitely paint over the top of it again. You can calm down maybe some areas like maybe, you know, right now it's too much of a good thing. Yeah, I agree. Like my eye doesn't know, like up here is very gorgeous. You got these turquoise next to these oranges, which is one of the most amazing color combinations a painter can do, but it's right on the edge. Uh, and then down here, you got purple versus yellow, which is, again, one of the most exciting, beautiful color combinations that the painter has in their arsenal. But it's the whole thing. It's the whole band. So my attention really does come here, which I think is where you want it. So maybe keep it kind of within this area and then gray down kind of along here. We'll keep our focus in here. And then I would probably radiate my colors out from there and kind of dull down some of the colors in this corner kind of dull down some of these colors. And if you really like the turquoise, maybe bring it down a little lower so that our attention is now still kept within kind of this area. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. I'm constantly thinking, well, how is my eye moving? You know, shooting back and forth really quickly. Um, and where do I want it to go? I think I want it kind of in here and then maybe to slowly get up here, not to jump from here to here. Right, because that's, our two of our biggest contrasting colors are here and here. Contrasting values is probably within here. Um, but anyways, great. It's almost, it's one of those funny things. It's almost too much of a good thing. Too much dessert, right? Doesn't make a meal. Get us, you want get sick if you eat too much, too much sweets. Want just a touch. Fair enough. At least that's what my grandma used to say. Um, I'm going to call it there just so we have time to get through. I'm going to go over to albums really quickly. And I'm just going to show some reference from the clouds. Um, I'm going to grab, I didn't really pick any to turn uh, to show. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do stop share. Hey, everybody, how are you? And share screen again. And we're going to go to Photoshop right now. So for those of you who um, don't have Photoshop, don't worry. I simply use this as a tool to be able to um, show uh, kind of some of my thinking and to be able to zoom in and out, to change it to black and white, and to uh, do various things. I'm going to start with this great big bright orange square over here. Um, this is a painting I kind of want to do very quickly in black and white. So let's look at it in black and white, right? And it's crazy, right? Why would you do something like this in black and white when the whole coolness of it is the colors, right? That 
that uh, transition of really bright light to up here to duller, but really warm light and the grays up here. So it's all about that. And I know that, right? So when I look at this photo, when I look at my reference, I say, what is this about? What is the main thing? Why did I take this picture in the first place, right? And it was definitely these exciting uh, value and temperature gradations within the sky, right? I've got dark darks and light lights, warms and cools. I've got it all. But I want to show it to you doing it as a black and white. And then I'm going to glaze over and bring those colors back. Okay, so I'm going to adjust and desaturate. Bang. Still beautiful, in my opinion. Mm. Right? It's still got nice movement. It's still got uh, interesting shapes. So a lot of times when I'm thinking about painting something and it's maybe more about the color, I, or at least my instinct is that it's about the color, I will quickly test it in black and white. I can either aim my camera, my smartphone at it and take a picture. And you know, within that, I can very quickly change it to black and white um, or Photoshop or on my printer, if, you know, if it's on my computer, I can print it as black and white as well. Oftentimes when I'm painting from multiple references, I will have a black and white printed and a color of it printed. Um, that is just, I've tried to be just a colorist, but uh, values really help somehow with my brain. We're all different and you'll find your own way of working. For some of you, the black and white aspect of it, the value and the underlying structure that getting the black and white gives us, isn't as necessary. But for me, I sure get in trouble when I try to shortcut my system. So you'll kind of discover your way of working, what works best for you. And uh, anyways, so I like having a value structure. Um, what I like in this painting is the sense of movement. Let me find a tool to draw with here, right? So we've got this nice horizontal, right? very steady, very calm. And let's give it some ruler. So my land is only out of a, I'm gonna change it to a 10 inch size so I can, or 12 inch. So I can just give you some examples. View fit on screen. So I've got the ruler beside it. So my land is only an inch and a half out of 10 inches. And then that means eight and a half inches are all sky. So none of us are ever gonna doubt what this landscape or this painting is about, right? This painting is, a, you know, it has some land in it, but it is not about the land. Um, so I can just turn that off. Thought I had it muted, but it's not muting. All right, I'll see if that works. Um, so are you saying that you're gonna where that orange line is, you are going to invent land that only goes that high? No, sorry. I was just, um, let's get, oops. Let's get rid of that pencil mark. Um, no, I was just trying to show you that that is, that is a, such a horizontal. That is, that is going to be kind of the antithesis to a lot of the other movement. So the horizontal aspect of this landscape is very relaxing, very restful and very much doesn't draw too much attention to it. There are some verticals in here, meaning some trees, and then a slight, ever so subtle angle of the hill, right? But all in all, quite boring down here, which is great because I want this to be a supporting character for the sky. This is a sky painting. So the land, you know, maybe I wanna bring you in, I could bring in some fields, oops, you know, I could, I do that from time to time. I'll subtly hint at a couple rolling uh, rows of plants just to kind of invite the viewer in a little bit. Um, we'll see, I might just hint at that. And what that does is automatically, when I put those angled lines in down below, the, all of a sudden these lines of the sky start coming into play a little more, don't they? So now we have things that are beginning to point towards 
where I'm hoping the viewer is going to go, which will be the yellowest yellow, the brightest bright when I, when I add the color. Um, what's also I like in this is I have this gesture, right? I have to look for it a little bit, but I can feel that gesture. I like that movement. Um, I have some counter gestures. Right? And I can play these up. I do not need to be stuck to what's available. I can move some of these clouds if I want. Maybe I make this cloud a little more angled. Um, maybe I get rid of these darks over here. Um, right? But I'm looking for elegant lines. I'm looking for gesture. I'm looking for a little bit of movement. I like to think of it as dance. If I just painted, you know, row upon row of uh, horizontal clouds, it'd be very boring to me. So, um, you know, and that's up to you where if you think it's there, if you want to play it up, you know, I could very much play up this cloud within here, but it's very horizontal, just like the land, right? So I may have it in here, but I'm going to use it as a counter to these beautiful angles. Right? Does that make sense a little bit, guys? So I'm looking for kind of the flow. And it's nice, too, when you can actually get the, the ground to even kind of feed into that. So how would I, if I want the, the angle of here is important to me, maybe what I'll do is bring in a little bit of foreground bushes or something here, kind of at an angle aiming towards that maybe something a little bit here. I want to keep it probably subtle. It's also just creating a line that's pointing up to here, pointing up to here. And now I've got my dancey, hopefully movement throughout. Does that make sense at all? Maybe this isn't the greatest example of clouds with the gesture. Maybe this one is going to be a little more obvious. Right, this is Italy. Um, this is the view from my little farmhouse that I stayed in for a week, two weeks, I can't remember, um, near Luca. Luca's down there in the valley. And uh, every morning I would wake up and watch the sun rise from behind this mountain. I got a lot of time-lapsed videos where I'd set up my iPad and then I would be running around like a mad person with my camera taking photos. Or I would try painting it, which was also running around like a mad person because it was happening so fast. But I knew by being out there for a couple of days, I knew that the sun was going to rise from behind those mountains and kind of come up at this angle. So I was able to kind of forecast it and kind of figure out what was going to happen. I would just be pleasantly surprised each day by the different clouds and the different weather. Um, you know, the fog sometimes would sit in here so thickly that it would almost appear like floating islands. Sometimes the, you know, you didn't see any of the landforms way back there. But anyways, I like this day um, because it has a combination. It's got enough clouds for energy and excitement. It's got warm colors, cool colors. It's got lights. It's got darks. It's got all sorts of different contrast. And it has a beautiful gesture to it, right? And you guys can probably see this, right? You probably already kind of know what I'm going to do. Right? Isn't that nice? Right? It already begins to feel kind of dancey. Right? So I've got all these different gestural lines that I can play up. I can ignore certain ones. I could just do it all based on, um, you know, I could just do it all based. I could really just play up one gesture. If I want, you see how kind of dancey and flowy and maybe not the most elegant. So maybe I would try again. What is it? that I'm liking. What is, you know, if you want to be a little more crass, what's the sexy line? 
again, I used to have an instructor in college that would say that all the time. Where's the sexy line? Um, so yeah, but I like what's the elegant line? What's where's the movement? Where can you have the eye kind of following along either by contrast, by color, by temperature? whatever it is, and it doesn't have to be overbearing, right? A lot of times these lines are barely there. They're just kind of hinted at and the viewer will fill them in. And a lot of times by the time the painting is completed, the, li the, the, the elegant line, the gesture of it is kind of lost, right? I'm using that kind of as an armature, right? If you think of a sculpture, like let's pretend we were gonna build with clay a figure we would use, we would take some wire, right? And we would take a wire here and we would take a wire here, right? And, and this is not the thing to do with the painting right now, right? This is my figure I'm building with an armature and, you know, some wires here. And then I would slowly begin to wrap my clay and everything around it and building up the form and all the structure, right? So that's my little figure running, I guess. I don't know what he's doing. Um, but that's what I mean by kind of what's the gestural line? What's the flow? What's the energy? What's the danciness of it? Um, and we can all pick different things. There's so many different ideas. This could be, maybe it's not as flowy as I'm putting it. Maybe it's more dramatic. Bam, bam. Maybe this one, you know, for you is much more about the energy. Bam. Remember angles give energy. Bam, bam, right? So I can start to look at it. There we go. Now we're starting to connect our angles, right? And it can be very angular. I can make this much more dramatic, kind of like some of the uh, paintings that we looked at last week with the very angular shapes. There's uh, tons of different ways we can approach this painting. Um, yeah. Does that make sense to you guys talking about gesture? I don't want to beat a dead horse too much here. But kind of just, it's something well, I can say that your sense of imagination is much better than mine. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Boy, this is leaving me just behind. <laughs> you know, I see the mountain coming down and then because of that little hill in front kind of dipping up, I see that line. The lines you were making were leaving me. Sure, and I'm, you know, I'm making them up to a degree, right? I'm, I, what do I like about this cloud? I like the cloud because it has this movement to it, right? It's interesting to me, you know, kind of this mm -hmm. shape. Okay. And, and so aren't you also using the, the negative space? Very much, and it can be based on the positive. It can be based on the negative. It can be anywhere you want. And this, again, this is just another tool. If this doesn't speak to you, but for me, oftentimes, it's like I get my horizon line in because that gives me my, you know, let's start again. My first thing, if I was painting this, is I would want to know where is that horizon line? Bang, right there, right? Just so I know where the earth is. <laughs> Where's the sky? Where's the earth? That horizon line, and it may not be perfect. I can't see back there. It's kind of obliterated by fog and clouds. But I'm going to put it down so that I know. And then, you know, my next big shapes are I've got this shape here. I've got these hills here, and I've got these hills here. I've got this, you know, and I'm just simplifying the shapes. The clouds there, and then I've kind of got the highlights there. Right? When you follow the cloud shapes, then I get it. Yeah. But you, you weren't following the cloud shapes at all, and I was lost. Okay. Yeah, and I'm just kind of playing up aspects that are, you know, where can I, and I can manipulate these clouds, right? I can completely change, you know, they don't need to be exactly like this. I could, let's go back again. Let's do something like, um, well, you're thinking like an artist and I haven't gotten there yet. So sure. Um, right. So I can, now I can manipulate this. So let's say that I really like this, but I want the movement more. I want higher up in the sky and I want this warmth bigger. So I would be doing this mentally, not on Photoshop, but let's make that sky. Right. 
right? I can um, need to bring this down so I can take that up. Oh. Right? Now it's even more spectacular, mm -hmm. possibly, um, but it's got more movement. Um, the cool thing with Photoshop is I can even do in, uh, edit. Uh, I can do transform in different ways, which I can even do like distort. So I can even um, change just different lines, right? I could say. So within Photoshop, I have lots of options. Um, you know, I can make that angle more and just pretend, you know, fill this back in. Um, so anyways, yes, you're right. Um, I am thinking kind of what would make it more elegant? What would make, you know, what would be the epitome of elegance? It's Italy, right? It's gotta be elegant. You know, everybody goes shopping at the grocery store in suits and full jewelry and makeup. I gotta, you know, if you're gonna paint Italy, you gotta go for it. Um, so yes, you're right, I am. But do you see these, you know, within these hills, there are lines. Right. And I can decide which of those to play up, which of those to play down. And so if I decide, you know what, I really like this movement within the cloud. I can find kind of where it fits into the hills. So I can maybe play up this contrast a little more. Maybe I bring that fog down. Maybe I angle that fog a little bit. Right. And connect. So I'm playing up that angle. If that's the elegant line I'm after, maybe. Right? Yeah. That is a nice, flowing, elegant line. And again, it will be, it's just, these are all preliminary notes for us. So when I look at the painting in the very beginning, I mean, the photo, right, I am saying, why did I take this photo in the first place? Was it because it was just a good memory, sunrise in Italy, right? Yeah, that's a great memory, but is that enough? No, I, I took thousands of photos when I was there, probably literally. Um, so why this one? What is different about this that I like? And I could say, well, it's got some of these old kind of uh, farmhouses, that's neat. It's got, you know, whatever. But no, the reason is, because again, I've got hundreds of photos of these farmhouses. It's this bright, cloud and the dark cloud the warm and the cool the sun hasn't even peaked around the hill it's still behind the hill and what also is really neat is i've got fog right that helps break up this big dark landmass. i could even bring in more if i want so that being said it's about this temperature shift for me it's about the warms and the cools um and it's also the fact that these clouds are Interesting. That is interesting to me, that movement. So that's what I'm looking for. All right, let's look. Uh, do, I, do you guys understand hard and soft edges within clouds? I don't want to beat that up too much. But if this is kind of my focal area, right, this is kind of the, the big spot. So this is kind of like, you know, this cloud is really exciting. Um, so maybe I can just even expand my focal area to be kind of like there, getting messy, right? But I'm also thinking about that. What, where do I want the viewer to look? What is the big payoff? What is the, you know, the, why did I choose this? It's literally because of this area. This other stuff is awesome, and it's a beautiful supporting cast. So I'm probably going to keep some of these edges a little harder than, area, than the areas outside of that right? Because the viewer is attracted to crisp edges and strong contrast, right? So with outside of this, I can have very soft, almost lost edges. Like there's areas where you don't even know where the cloud begins and the cloud ends, right? It's just kind of soft, soft. You just don't know. In other areas where the cloud is much more distinct, much more crisp, much more vibrant. And uh, does that make sense, you guys? So I think about these things. Where do I want the viewer to look? How do I want the viewer's eye to move? And I'm going to use color contrast, temperature contrast, warms and cools. 
value contrast, lights and darks, and edge contrast, hard edges and soft edges. Viewers are attracted to hard, crisp edges, right? So that will bring us into the foreground. Oops, sorry, a little too, hold down my zoom in a little long, but I'll have some nice crisp edges in here because that will bring the, that appearance of that closer to us. And so, and then to simply keep edges hard and soft, the easiest way, of course, is by just how much brushing are you putting down? If you just make a stroke nice and gently, you know, lightly and leave it, you're going to probably end up with a firmer edge. If you put down a brush stroke and then hit it again and hit it again, or just touch it again, touch it again, you're starting to blend and soften. You're starting to merge the colors and the edges. So a lot of times what I will do is, um, just like we saw earlier, um, is uh, I will paint the clouds kind of nice and structural to start with, uh, kind of like Linda did in her, uh, the first example that we looked at of the student work. Um, and then I will go back, especially with oils, you have all the time, right? You can go back for a whole day probably. With a clean, dry brush, I can just go and kind of soften those edges by kind of feathering them out, remembering to hold our brush like a conductor or like a magician, like a wand, and softly touching those edges. And you can decide, you know, some edges are going to be completely obliter obliterated. That's called the lost edge, where again, you just don't know where the edge begins and where it ends, right? Think very foggy, very soft, very transient meaning moving, uh, or you can have in between where it's just kind of a slightly harder edge, but it's soft. It doesn't feel uh, really uh, strong. And that will be, you know, not quite as transient. It'll draw the attention a little more than this completely lost soft edges, but it will be not as attractive as the hard edges. Am I making sense, Jill? Is this making sense? Great. Yep. Perfect. Anybody have any questions on that? That was a lot, and I apologize. That was so much. And I know that the gesture, again, uh, Kathleen or anybody else who's kind of having a tough time with gesture, think if I were painting dancers, if the clouds were dancers, what's that first line I would put down to kind of capture the movement of that dance? If it's not there, it's not there. If it's too weird to think like that, don't bother with it. Again, I'm just trying to give you guys lots of tools, <clears throat> lots of ways of thinking, and some are gonna work for some of you. Each week, you guys, if you take home one thing out of the 20 or 30 things I tell you, that's enough, right? One thing a week is a lot when it comes to painting. I just want to give you guys a lot of tools, a lot of opportunities. And the cool thing is, is you take one thing today and then you come back and watch the video a week later or a couple of days later, you might pick up one other thing. Now you got two things that week. And that's all I really want you to do is work on a couple things during the week. Um, if you're working on too many things, you're too far out of your comfort zone and you're probably not learning as quickly as if you were kind of focusing in on just a couple of things. So the gesture. For some of us, not for all of us, I get that. Um, and believe me, I still take workshops each year uh, from uh, instructors and it's the same, same, why is it going backwards? Um, the same thing happens to me. Like, you know, some things just go over my head or sometimes I'm just thinking about the thing that I think is so revolutionary that I completely miss the next concept or two because I'm in my head quickly painting paintings of how would I use this? Where would this have been helpful? Where were you my whole life? A uh, little bit of information. Michael, yes. Is is leading the eye and gesture, are they synonymous? I would say that is a really good point, actually. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's the movement. It's the flow. That is a really good way of thinking of it. Man, that's why it's great to have another teacher in the class. <laughs> Thank you. Can you repeat that? Go for it, Kathleen. That's yours. I asked if leading the eye was synonymous with gesture. And I think it is. I think that again, how I'm leading the eye through this, kind of what's that nice movement? 
when I think of elegant lines, I should, I, uh, never mind, I'll, I'll look up some old cars, but I really think of like the, I think it's the 50s old automobiles with their bulbous, beautiful shapes and everything. There was a wonderful show in, in Portland Art Museum of motorcycles and automobiles. And I, I think the era was the 50s. Um, you know, like, it's just so cool. And they made such limited runs of these amazing cars. And it was all about design, you know, and also kind of, um, I've been doing a lot of research this week on um, kind of the retro modern, kind of the uh, 30s, uh, 40s furniture designs, um, kind of the Scandinavian kind of look with their flowy lines and rounded edges and stuff. Um, we've inherited some furniture from my great grandma, well, a while ago, but I'm trying to refinish it. Are you, are you thinking Art Deco? Art Deco, definitely. I look Art at uh, uh, Mucha, Alphonse Mucha, all the time. I, okay. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of Art Deco. Uh, yeah, and I guess that would play into the, the yeah, Art Deco, Art Nouveau um, also has a lot of beautiful lines. Um, yeah, and I try to bring that into my trees and now into my clouds more. Um, it's one of those things that people don't tell you about your painting, but they can feel, right? We've all walked into a house that has beautiful flow and beautiful lines. We've all, you know, be at big hotels or somebody's residence. We've also looked at yards that have beautiful flows like where the path just kind of leads the viewer into the garden and through the garden. Um, so whatever it is for you, it's going to be different. So anyways, um, don't want to go that over that too much. I am going to use these two paintings as um, <clears throat> my references. I'm going to start with this crazy guy and go back to <laughs> doesn't look like it'll let me go all the way back to the beginning. So I'll just have to reopen it. Um, Save changes? No, do not save those changes. Um, here it is. Anyways, we're going to take a little break. And I'm going to paint this in black and white, like I said. Then I'm going to flip very quickly over to this one, do it with color. It's going to be very gestural, <laughs> very flowy, very not, you know, I'm not going to get all the windows in the building or every, you know, all the trees. I'm going to look to the big shapes, the gesture and the color. And then on both of them, it's going to be about hard edges versus soft edges and controlling the view. Uh, after we get this one quickly painted, hopefully, I'm going to flash back over to this one. And we're going to close out the class by talking about uh, glazing and temperature shifts using transparent oil color. How does that sound? Good. We really fill this up, don't we? That's right. so much stuff. All right, you guys, let's take a 10 minute break. Oh, well, let's just come back at 10, 10, what do you think? 1025? And that way it'll give me time to set up my colors and everything else. I'm gonna start with acrylics and I'll go ahead and set up my oil colors. I'm gonna use the split primary palette, uh, which is two reds, two yellows, two blues and titanium white. And I may add uh, Payne's gray just for uh, speeding up the color a little bit um, for the, uh, for the um, value study. I'm just gonna use black and white acrylic paint and I'm gonna throw just a touch of burnt umber into the black so that it's not a complete dark blue. And I'm gonna add just a touch of yellow into the white so that it's not a very, very, very cold white. Um, and then I will mix the in between. Um, that's just something I found when I go to glaze that if I just use black and white, everything turns greenish because it, uh, because the black is just a very, very dark blue and it makes everything very cool. So anyways, there we go. Break. See you guys in a bit. What was the color you throw into the white? I'm just going to throw a tiny bit of yellow. Are you sure you want to stop recording? 